Welcome to season one, two, three, four, five of Meet the Drapers, the world's largest international business plan competition. We're going global. We traveled the globe scouring the US, India, Taiwan, Portugal, Canada, and Brazil for their best and brightest entrepreneurs. This is amazing. Every week, these entrepreneurs will compete against their countrymen for a chance to make it to our international semifinals and then on to finals to compete for a $1 million investment from Tim Draper himself. The crystal ball ultimately chooses. But here's the twist. Your favorite business eliminated too early? Vote them back into the finale to get a second chance in front of judges Tim. This could be quite a thing. Holly. It's kind of exciting to people. And Bill Draper. That's a real plus in this case. As well as their VIP guest judges. Let the games begin. We're funding Welcome everybody to Meet the Drapers. Great to have you, you're still here. This is our fifth season and our ninth show. Some really interesting entrepreneurs are coming today from the East Coast. I'm Tim Draper, I'm a venture capitalist with Draper Associates. My father is here, he was a pioneer in venture capital. And is my sister, Polly Draper, an actress, director, producer, writer. Today's guest judge is Shalini Govil Pai, and Shalini is the general manager and vice president of Google TV. Well, Welcome to the show, Shalini. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how these people should think about their media strategy? There used to be a very standard windowing process. Those are windows are all breaking apart now. The business models are changing from producers being wholesalers and selling to a distributor to them going direct to consumer themselves. And that's changing the economics for them. It's changing the way that they're engaging with their customers. Netflix, of course, was the pioneer here, and we're seeing a lot of that being turned around. Terrific. Okay, let's bring on the entrepreneurs. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. My name is Angela Edwards, and I am co-founder and COO of Pixi. My name is Kurt Edwards. I'm co-founder and CEO of Pixi. We are looking to revolutionize the way that hiring is done with skills-based recruiting. We are biased against individuals based on, it could be race, it could be culture, and it could be gender. And those are things that we should look beyond and just start hiring individuals for who they truly are and what they bring to the table. We are fortunate that we've known each other for so long. We are married since we met each other in college as lab partners. It lends to us just having great relationship and a great friendship and great support in building this company. We really want to impart a better world, um, not only for our children, but for all the future generations that are coming up. Let's hear from our first contestants. Pixi, go ahead and give us your pitch. Resumes are the tool used to evaluate talent in the 70s and 80s. Unfortunately, not much has changed until today. Let's take a look at this sample resume that we have here. In today's world, most recruiters will actually pass on this individual for a tech leadership role. This individual was a dropout. And if you're curious, this is actually the resume of Steve Jobs. <laughs> Unfortunately, his resume did not convey what actually makes him successful in his future career. Hiring is mostly based off technical skills and education or training, but we all know that the best performers have excellent communication skills, great problem solving abilities, have grit, and they're also great team players. So how do companies identify these intangible skills in high performers so that they can empower their teams and culture? Hixi is an AI powered video assessment tool that evaluates 43 intangible skills. We do this by putting all our job applicants through a synchronous video interviewing platform. We 
give them scenario-based job-related questions, and then we extract their competencies using our AI models. The recruiters in the back end get robust reporting, data, and also a video of the candidate's answers. So give us an example. Ask me a question. Um, if we're testing for integrity, let's say, Joe decided to leave early from work today, and he told you specifically, can you cover for me if the manager wants to check in on me? No. That is the correct <laughs> answer. I would <laughs> I would totally have said yes, so oh, no. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Give us a few more examples. So interpersonal skills, you think of communication, right? If I ask you to describe that round object in front of you, I'm curious to what you would say. It's spiritual know-all, see-all, smell-all, and it is uh, how we make all our big decisions. So that's, a, that's an <laughs> indicator right there of how we would measure your communication skills. How concisely were you able to describe that object. That's a fuzzy thing. Is that AI, or do you use AI for So that? it's not a fuzzy thing because we give you an image and so there are certain things that we're looking for, oh, right? Oh, I see. Okay, so, so everything we do is specific words that yes. I've got to come up with. Yes. So more intent, we train AI models based on all the possible answers that one could give in describing that object. And that's essentially what we look for. So in all the scenarios that we create, there's real science behind that. In fact, we hire PhD psychologists and build our AI models based on decades of research data. Most assessments for soft skills utilize sliding scales and multiple choice. They are actually not that great because they lead. What we've done differently is we identified what are the best answers and what's not so good answers. And then we embed those ranges of answers in the AI. Who buys, is this a SaaS product? Yes, yeah, SaaS corporate? Enterprise. HR buys it or who buys it? HR buys this. Is the thought that somebody gets interviewed, the company likes them, they send them over to HR, HR then runs them through this test, and then that feedback loop goes back to the management. The recruiter or the hiring manager. So what our product does is that we work at the top of the funnel. So we help you to identify who these individuals are in conjunction with well, how well they qualify for the actual job. They use your software before they have the management interview. Correct. And one of the advantages of doing it that way too is that we help to reduce those unconscious biases that happen at the front of the, the top of the funnel where the good candidates get weeded out without really truly knowing who they are. Yeah. What are the data sources for your training? We're a Y Combinator company. We have access to a lot of YC startup. We work with schools. So our PhD psychologists, they're actually faculty members at, at universities. So we have a large subset at any given point between 30 to 100,000 that we send our data out to. We collect and we have our psychologists that curate that data and train our AI models. How's it doing? We're doing great. In terms of traction, it's a $21 billion market opportunity for us. We charge $150 per job, and the typical job stays in the market for four months. So that's in so our market per opportunity. Job, it's not a SaaS product. Per job, per month. We lock them in for a year at for like that job slot. Oh, I see. You grab the job slot. And they can they go can in reuse, and out. They can you reuse you job figure slots? out some way, just charge them a monthly so that they can just budget for it? They we're charging them monthly, but we lock them in for one year. But so then, then the year's up, and I'm thinking not per job, but just for the whole company. That's the ideal scenario. Let me what, tell you a little wait, bit what are about your revenues. $25,000 a monthly recurring revenue. We have 21 paying customers, and we're onboarding 10 Fortune 500 companies to a special partnership within the next month. We also sign a large state government yes, that, that is using juicy. our product for mm -hmm. hiring for police, fire, and they actually operate a very large international U.S. Um, airport. Is there a valuation that's been pegged? We are $18 million valuation right now. 18 million. 18 mm -hmm. million. And that all happened before the stock market slid, right? YC actually advised us to be somewhere between 20 to 25, but given what was going or what's going on right now, we are dropping it to 18 so we can get our fundraising, our seed funding out the way real quickly and get back to work. How much are you trying to raise? Anywhere between two and three at this particular point. Terrific. Well, thank cool. you so much for thank being you. on Meet the for Drapers. Thank you for having us. It's great to see you. I love thank you, you guys Terrific. so much. Thanks so Thanks, much for being on Meet the thank Drapers. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. So what did all of you think of PixEye? It's a really interesting idea to try to get into the psychology of people's minds before you hire them to see if they're a good fit. I think it has some potential. Shalini, what'd you think? There's a lot of focus on using AI for job candidate hunt. 
So that is happening. It is, so it's a market that's rising. Is in that general, happening at Google? We have been looking at certain programs. It really depends on your training data. Like AI is useless if your training data is not robust. We have to be really, really careful that the data is equitable and that, you know, for example, Steve Jobs, he might have been screened out completely yeah. depending on how your training data worked. I just love those two people. They were so smart and so enthusiastic and so passionate. And so I just wanted to be around them. Yeah, they're fantastic, both of them. I didn't get that they were thinking as far ahead as I would hope they would. They've got to have a vision for this. This can go really deep. There is a lot of competition. Yes. I mean, don't, undoubtedly. And this is definitely top of the funnel, as they said. Still, great team. Let's bring on the next entrepreneur, but before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. I'm Emma Butler, I'm the CEO and founder of Intimately, and I'm from Portsmouth, Rhode Island. The world needs Intimately because disabled people deserve to have functional and fashionable clothing. I'm only 24. I only had one other internship before I started this company. I knew that if I wanted to do this well, I was going to have to throw everything into this. So what Intimately does and why it's so important is that not only do we allow really functional clothing for people to get on, but it also is beautiful and sexy and fashionable. And those two things together are incredibly important for our identities, our confidence, and everybody, including disabled women, especially deserve to feel that way. Intimately to me represents a more inclusive future. Let's go into this together and show that everybody deserves to feel fashionable and functional. So as a part of making Meet the Drapers even more fun, even more fun than it is, we have instituted a new game. It's called Draper X, and you can download it on the iPhone or on Google Play. You can participate. And so while you watch Meet the Drapers and you see these great entrepreneurs present, you can invest your funny money into those companies. And if your company goes and becomes a semi-finalist, you get 5X on your money. If in the semifinals, your company moves up to the finale, you get another 5X on your money. If your company ends up winning, you get another 10X on your money. Because so we're gonna have a leaderboard and the winners are gonna get big prizes from Meet the Drapers. I hope you'll download the game. It's called Draper X and you'll play it with us and be a part of Meet the Drapers. All right, let's listen to our next entrepreneur. This is Emma Butler at Intimately. Emma, give us your pitch. About 10 years ago, my mom became chronically ill. It was really difficult for her to get dressed with her limited hand dexterity and putting things on over her head. So we looked for new clothing that met her new needs. And I watched my mom's confidence plummet. My mom's not alone in this. In fact, 600 million women worldwide have some sort of disability that affects the way they dress. Buttons, zippers, hooks and eyes. My mom still has to fiddle with those things, but we can send a man to the moon. Intimately is creating new fasteners using magnets and other things that make dressing so much easier for everybody. We're also working on new constructs and designs. So apart from the fasteners that we're working on getting patented, Think about the ways that we have to get on clothing. If you're in a wheelchair and you can't lift your legs, how do you put pants on one leg at a time? So reconstructing the garments with side openings and other things that is truly innovative. We were approached by so many of the biggest brands in Intimates to help them launch into the adaptive space the same way that they launched into maternity and plus size in the last 10 years. So in the next few months, you'll see collab co-branded with the biggest names in Intimates with Intimately licensing our technology to these big brands. And we see that as a huge revenue driver in the future. And our brand has disabled folks in it from our board members to our C-suite all the way to our interns. We've raised $1.2 million from the British Fashion Council as their very first investment. And we're so excited to truly make the fashion industry inclusive for disabled people, anyone with limited mobility or who's temporarily injured, and just make clothing easier to get on. Are you the creator or designer of these fasteners? And is that what you're patenting? Yes, and we have more. We have about three in the pipeline that we're working on getting patented to. How much have you sold so far? So right now we had a really limited run and we just started with 200 units in each of our styles, our six styles, and we've sold out of all of those. We've just crossed the, just about the six figure mark between wholesales and our new line. And are you selling them direct to consumer or are you selling through retail? 
So this first batch was just direct to consumer and now we're just starting to go into wholesale. What are the numbers? I, I didn't hear, what are your sales now? Close to around $50,000 in sales from our very first run. Are you only doing intimates? So we're starting with intimates and we're moving into regular clothing in the next 18 months. We wanted to start with intimates because it's the first thing to get on. Going into workwear next because ultimately that's where the biggest pain point is for disabled dressers and it's one of the hardest things to get on and also the most meaningful. I'm very sensitive to this because I broke seven of my ribs when I fell off a horse. For a long time, I couldn't do a pullover. So I had to, everything was a Hawaiian shirt and I, yep. couldn't, I, I couldn't reach my feet. And so everything was a slip on. And our mom had Parkinson's disease. And I remember so many times trying to get her bra on. We were in a shopping in a store and she got caught in mid try on of a shirt that they had to cut her out of. We couldn't get it off and oh, we just wow. bought it. Yeah. You're yeah. hitting a real need. I've seen a few companies doing similar things. Is this a trend? What's going on? What's your competition look like? So there are a few other people that, that are moving into this space. Ultimately, the disabled population is not very happy with this. They're being called out for performative activism. Disabled people know when they're not included. We have a disabled team from our board members to our C-suite to our interns. It's not only people in front of the camera, it's people behind the camera, it's the marketing team, it's the business team. Part of our philosophy is being truly authentic and that's one of the reasons why these big brands want to partner with us as well. By the way, this is women's lingerie. This is not, you don't have men's. Not yet. The reason we're starting with women's is because of our community. We have over 400 women that we chat with almost on a daily basis. We also have an app that's on the app store that we're waiting to launch until Q4 so they can shop for intimately and have these meaningful conversations and meet new friends, but also inform us on product and continue to inform us. Where is your community, Emma? Is it on your app? So the app's ready to go, but we just haven't announced it yet. There via email, via Slack. We chat with folks in, in regular coffee chats and have Zoom meetings as well, all online. So a lot of our conversations are these events that we have. Other than the story about your mom, what's your background? I am not maybe like the other entrepreneurs on this show. I started intimately when I was in my dorm room at Brown. Our catalyst was thanks to you, Tim, when we won first place in the Smith College Draper Award in 2020. Oh. And that was the first time that people really believed in intimately. And then from there, we were able to oh, raise so cool. a million dollars. I've spent four years dedicated to this, doing hundreds and hundreds of interviews with disabled people, truly understanding this, learning it from the bottom up. Terrific. Well, Emma, thanks so much for being on Meet the Drapers. Great to see that Intimately has gone beyond the Smith Draper Business Plan competition, and, and now you're doing great things. Oh, it's so great to see you again, Tim, and uh, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure to be here today. All right, thank you, thank everyone. You. So what did all of you think of Intimately? That was very exciting. Really interesting what she's doing. Polly, what did you think? Well, we, the, we girls <laughs> looked at the bra and it's, um, you know, it latches in the front and, may, you know, goes around. I can't, now I can't do it, but whatever. You know, it's like this. It looks like it's harder to put on than a I normal. know, right now I was like, I'm not doing a You're good ad or advertisement for it, but easy. basically it's too small for me, but. See, so she doesn't need to button it, it's all magnetic. It's all yeah. magnetic. I mean, that's it. I love the design. It's lovely, mm -hmm. yeah. And well, then why, do you, why do you say that? So I had a frozen shoulder at one time and I couldn't put on my bra. I just, it's yeah. so hard. And then something like this would have been a lifesaver yeah. for me. Oh, I see. So if it is my size, I, I so that's need got that. magnets and this is Velcro. This is Velcro. So that's a little, easy I've seen, uh, yeah. And I've seen these before. You've seen Velcro. I've seen easy stuff, tear off. easy tear off stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's uh, the other. The uh, last episode. The last <laughs> episode, yeah. Anyway, it's a great idea. But so anyway. what did you think of the business? The folks who really understand that this space, what is their, what are their needs, what are their pain points, and how do we solve it? If the product is really that great, I think they've got a winner. Like a huge market. That's do you nice. think that she has what it takes to take it the whole way? She seems like she's made it her, made it she, her life. Yeah, she dug in, did, it learned all this stuff because of it. She was motivated by her mom and then she had friends who were in the community and 
Sometimes I, I worry that when things get tough, I don't ever know for sure whether the entrepreneur is gonna be there forever. It's gonna be a tough business. Although that community, it sounds like that's an easy community to sell to so that you could, the word just keeps spreading. If they really feel that it's a worthwhile product. That's right, yeah. Well, let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Our mission is to build a really socially responsible product. We are addressing a global problem and we come across with a fantastic product over here for special education kids. Autism is a you know, really big problem in, in society and we need to very, very carefully understand it and make sure that the, what data need to be captured for effective training and also the best intervention plan need to be designed. We built this product from the scratch and we know that there is a you know end goal for this product. There's a vision in us and we are working on keeping that vision on forward. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Tim Draper. If you got a great idea, go ahead and send it to me. And who knows, you might be the next big contestant. We'll be right back after this. So let's bring on our next entrepreneur from Embright and Infotech. Go ahead and give us your pitch. I'm addressing here a global problem. One in 169 having issues of autism spectrum disorder. So here we're looking forward how to resolve various challenges happening in centers like, you know, training centers, autism centers, schools, special education schools as well. We're introducing a product called AutiCare. It's an assistive technology inclusive learning platform and we're using technology like XR and AI. XR stands for extended reality. We use virtual reality and mixed reality tools to give much more positive reinforcement, to, you know, therapies for kids who are having actually issues with the attention issues as well. Uh, we're working on this for past four years with a team size of 14 members. And we already worked with different hospitals, 150 different hospitals as well, and tested out in, you know, much more effective national centers as well. Do you provide virtual reality, the virtual reality module, and the brain computer interface diagnosis? Yes. And the exactly. AI-based behavior data? Do you take those from other companies and then do sort of, sort of a holistic approach to somebody who has the problem? Exactly. Okay. So it's assembled completely in this module and we use eye tracking sensors to understand about the attention issues as well. Here we develop much more interactive and effective positive reinforcement contents in virtual reality games. We have 150 different contents and scenarios as well. So we build it up for different language and we expanding to in different, uh, you know, demography region as well. So we're looking to rise around 2 million with the you know, valuation of 10 million right now. And we already raised on 150K with a revenue of 200K right now. So your revenues are 150,000 for the last 12 months. Is that what that is? Uh, last two years, uh, Tim. And how many people did you say you were? 14. So they're all building these modules because you have a couple, you have a module, you have an AI. Exactly. And and basically, you know, the data collection is one of the major important factors where the app is want to know about what is the actual situation of the kid, where do we have do they have development delays or speech delays? And they can design the individualized training plan with that data. And basically, uh, we are working with B2B institutions like uh, schools, special education schools, and also normal schools. They have special education uh, you know, uh, centers as well, and hospitals, private practitioners. Through them, we connect to the you know, parents where we can provide B2C modules as well for home training. The parents and the children, do they pay to come to you? Are they volunteering to come to you? What do you provide to them? So we provide training of how to give a proper, you know, uh, assistance to kids as well. So this tool is an assisted technology tool where parents will get help how to train the kids more effectively. Moreover, we're dealing with, uh, you know, institutions and clinics. So they're providing much more effective training through our tech. So the parents pay you and the researchers pay you. Exactly. So we capture the kids' data there. $7 per month is what our SAS model. And uh, $30, $20, $35, and $65 is the researchers and the clinicians. What do the AI things do? What They play games with them? What do they do? Uh, basically, the data is captured from eye tracking sensors, basically understanding about their, you know, typical, uh, you know, attention span as well and reaction time as well, behavioral issues, behavioral patterns as well. So this data will predict what sort of 
interventions is required for the next three months or six months of their individual training plan. And it's just so, autistic children? It's not like ADHD children or? No, it's can use, uh, you know, different development delays as well, not just autism alone. How do you work with a brain computer interface? What are you doing there? We're using uh, 14 third party, uh, you know, hardware. We're using their plugins to understand about the kid's anxieties, his fear of heights, and fear of you know different uh, you know other aspects for example water the insects as well and uh, we'll put or mimic different scenarios in virtual reality and understand about these aspects and what is your success rate with these children i mean have you been able to quantify that so we connected with 150 centers so far and all, all, almost around 3600 kids already been used in india in south part of india itself our kids training pattern or learning curve is being improved their attention span is improving and are the parents saying the same things like, are they coming back to you and saying, wow, this changed our lives? We have various testimonials from different institutions, and it's all in Malayalam language and mm -hmm. also in South Indian language as well. And we have really good uh, you know, um, response from these uh, trainers and parents as well. And why are you doing this? Why do you care? What gets you going? So basically my mom is a therapist. I'm seeing uh, the kids training since my childhood. I'm an engineer, electrical engineer, and I'm a product manager. Who else is on your team? So basically we are back with our AI team uh, and AI ex experts, uh, clinical psychologists, clinical linguistics. Dr. Sathi Narayan, thank you so much for being on Meet the Drapers. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. So what did all of you think of Embright Infotech? Someone is affected by autism. This might be a good process for them. Might end up learning something from the data they, they give off. Dad, what did you think of this one? Well, I was uh, caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> In general, I thought the, uh, the team looked like they knew what they were doing and... Yeah, I mean, he seemed like he looked he knew what he was doing because his mother had been involved with autistic children yeah. and had basically it's an aggregate kind of company. They they put together data based on the the, the VR, VR the, the brain computer interface. Face. It seems like something that would be necessary. I think that's got enormous applications for health, for mental wellness, and for applications like these for autistic and disabled. So I think it's a definitely a very interesting market and space. I think the challenge for this company is going to be around scale. Are they expecting all the parents to have virtual reality devices at home? I got the, the feeling they have a stream of mm -hmm. children coming into their And that could be true like they have a school facility yeah. and then they put and the they VR put it there. on them. You know, this to me sounded like a research project. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like this is going to be a trillion dollar business. It felt like we're doing interesting things, we're testing a lot of things, and we do provide some interesting feedback for parents, but for yep. now, yep. we're just getting data. Yeah. And that sounds a little bit more like a government grant to me. And also I think they're gonna have to do it in conjunction with research institutes. So it's not gonna be a consumer. No. or a parent-driven product. Let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But before we do, let's see what's going on behind the screens and the scenes. <laughs> Back there, let's see what's going on. The world today is filled with distracted writing. In fact, information inhibits your way of transportation. We think it should be the other way around. So we were inspired by Iron Man specifically, like his Jarvis system was just so cool. We just wanted to make it real. You will never have to look down on your phone for any information ever again, and you will never have to take your hands off the handlebar. How do we differentiate ourselves? The next greatest idea has not been found yet. You really need to find that on your own. Go beyond not just starting a company, but also what can I do even more differently that's so radical that people have not heard it. What people who have come before us have done is shown us what doesn't work. And we learned from their experiences and made a company and a product that is better than what they have done before. And this is why we're poised for success. So as a part of making Meet the Drapers even more fun, even more fun than it is, we have instituted a new game. It's called Draper X, and you can download it on 
the iPhone or on Google Play, you can participate. And so while you watch Meet the Drapers and you see these great entrepreneurs present, you can invest your funny money into those companies. And if your company goes and becomes a semifinalist, you get 5X on your money. If in the semifinals, your company moves up to the finale, you get another 5X on your money. If your company ends up winning, you get another 10X on your money. So we're gonna have a leaderboard and the winners are gonna get big prizes from Meet the Drapers. I hope you'll download the game. It's called Draper X and you'll play it with us and be a part of Meet the Drapers. Let's hear from our next entrepreneur, Krishna and Parth, tell us about Etho. Hey Drapers, I'm Krishna, co-founder and CEO of Etho, and that's my co-founder Parth. And we build the hardware and software that makes traditional helmets smart. We're tackling a $63 billion helmet market. On average, a motorcycle rider rides with three different devices, like their GPS on their phone, intercom, and their action camera. Using these devices on a ride is quite cumbersome. To operate them, you have to pull over and come to a complete stop, or you're always looking at different uh, information on your handlebar. And if you try to operate anything on a ride, you're gonna get into a very, very serious crash. That's exactly what happened to me in 2016, December. While I was in the hospital, my co-founder Parth was visiting me. We both had very serious motorcycle accidents in the past, so we wanted to do something about it. And all the processing is in the helmet? Yes, so we have a custom built a board which has the processor and everything. Voice is central. It's not operated through the phone. The phone is almost just for data. And, and it talks so, to you. So we have most of our hardware on the on the helmet, which connects to a phone, which, a big which then processes. Oh, this fits. This is a custom helmet that we built specifically for you, Tim. Whoa. Oh, terrific. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring a motorcycle. <laughs> that is not your product, right? The helmet's not your product. The helmet is not, the yes. The software and the hardware in here? Correct. Is the GPS, is that just all audio or is that also on that screen? The GPS is audio and visual. The eventual goal is like, right now we are showing arrows, but the eventual goal is to sort of push this on the road where you would see arrows on the road guiding you which road you should take. But you're getting the data from the phone. Yeah, it says navigate. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Your dad, you want to try it on? Yeah. It's kind of heavy. It's actually lighter than typical helmets. Typical helmets are way around here. <laughs> yeah. are, these, are these blue things or those, what, what do they do? So volume up, volume down, and power. That's it. Oh, the blue buttons are? Yeah. You look good in there. I, I want a picture of that. I hope Space someone's man. taking a picture. Is, your, is it tight on your ears? It's, yeah, it's meant to be, to be snug. It's supposed to be. If yeah, it's not, then it you have a neck life. injury. So who is the helmet partner? So we actually don't partner with just one. We partner with every helmet company. Because you have to retrofit their helmets, right? Or, or to are they degree. redesigning their helmets to incorporate your stuff? So we are choosing the retrofit path, specifically because the shell of the helmet, that's subject to stringent regulations across different parts of the world. Millions of dollars goes into it, and usually a shell's life is about 15, 20, 30 years now, so that they're using the exact same shell. So to mess with the formula of a shell is close to $20 million just in getting that through. We designed the software first and we knew hardware was a big challenge. Companies have tried this before and failed, even though they raised $30 million because of the big challenge of making your own helmet. We are the only ones that successfully were able to make electronics small enough to fit on the outside of a helmet and be able to create whatever use case. How far along are you? So we haven't delivered any just yet. So we have 100 helmets at the moment and we are working on ramp, figuring out partners, manufacturing and all of that in China, India, Taiwan and here. Have you raised money? We've raised $1.5 million from Boost VC, from Forum Ventures, from Hustle Fund, from Boost Right Side VC. Capital Management. Yeah, from Adam. Also the retired CFO of Intel. We need to figure out how supply chain issues and everything will uh, pan out uh, in the right way. What supply are you missing? The, obviously the heads-up display is custom to us, so it's single source from one person, so the LED light engine, all of that, uh, that, that is where we are right now. Are you personally wearing them? As you yes. Wear What's happening out there? Our technical defensibility is what sets us apart from our other competitors. We're the only ones that were able to land these big helmet company deals. It's not new to get augmented reality technology anywhere and fit it wherever you want. 
but A, the integration is so tight that our custom software and hardware go really well together. So it won't just be motorcycles. Exactly. We can do direct integration of our tech into the next generation of motorcycles. Driverless car integration, so motorcycles will still remain relevant in the world of driverless car. Our tech will share data with them so that they understand the position of a motorcyclist. Terrific. Well, thank you for bringing Etho to meet the Drapers. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks so much for coming and meeting, thank you, meeting with us here at Meet the Drapers. Good to see you, Parth. See you, Tim. Oh, here's your helmet. <laughs>
so thankful for it. Tim did give us some feedback that we're going to bring back to the table and also continue our strategy um, based on his feedback. We just feel really lucky to be in this environment, but we're also, um, you know, very excited about the next steps.